Ladies and gentlemen, very good afternoon. Um, my name is Robert Lyons. I'm director of the British Council in India. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here to this panel discussion on freedom of speech and expression. And this will be chaired by John Kampfner. Unfortunately, Timothy Garton Ash has got laryngitis and won't be on the panel today. This session is uh, part of the Edinburgh World Writers Conference, which is a series of discussions taking place in 15 countries across the world. And it's a partnership between the British Council and the Edinburgh International Book Fair. Um, the original conference started in 1962, and 50 writers gathered in Edinburgh last year to discuss fi five themes, and one of the themes will be discussed today. So please give a warm welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. And um, once again, very good afternoon to everybody. Um, apologies again, uh, Timothy Gardner Ash, um, who, amongst uh, being a, a very well known academic and writer and journalist, um, runs the excellent uh, website and sort of communication discussion vehicle, freespeechdebate.com, and would very much urge you to engage with it. Um, it is in many languages, um, and it is taking very much an international focus on the increasing issue of our time, freedom of expression. So apologies that I am not Tim Gartnash, um, but um, I've had uh, many years of dealing with freedom of expression, initially running um, the UK-based international NGO index on censorship, which has looked at free expression issues for many years um, around the world. And now I um, advise Google on free expression and cultural issues around the world, particularly the issue of um, the internet and free expression questions um, online. I'll just say a few words by introduction before asking our panelists um, to make a few remarks themselves. Then we'll have a discussion and then we'll throw open um, to the audience. I think we'll give longer than we anticipated to the audience. Um, Jaipur being Jaipur and um, last year's events being last year's events and others too. Um, it is uh, amazing, although not necessarily surprising, that we have an audience of this size to engage with the issues of freedom of expression. Um, I will put them in two main categories that are relevant, in my opinion, to the Indian context, um, but equally, uh, albeit with different cultural, historical, geographical, economic variations around the world, um, they are generic. The first is the question of how governments, how authorities, how the state um, reacts to free expression, particularly free expression online and social media, with an increasing tendency around the world um, in uh, so-called uh, developed countries uh, and in emerging powers too, to almost desperately try to <laughs> control the internet, very much the state's uh, lashback, the state's trying to uh, introduce legislation around the world. In my country, the UK, um, we um, saw off, albeit I think it is only temporary, um, uh, an appalling piece of legislation um, dubbed the Snoopers Charter, which would have given the state unbridled powers to require internet service providers to store <clears throat> excuse me, all internet traffic, all email traffic, all text messaging, pretty much everything that you do for a year and to hand over whatever, not just the security services want, but local authorities, the, fa the fire service, pretty much any authority um, could um, snoop on what, you want, on, on what you were communicating anytime, any place, anywhere, pretty much um, without restriction. That has been seen off, but um, I think they will come back uh, having redrafted, um, looking for more. So there is no ideal jurisdiction. There is no paradigm um, for free expression, but some countries are resisting this urge to clamp down perhaps more than others. The other area, which I think is um, possibly more challenging to all of us, it's how we, the public, deal with it. How do we deal um, in uh, a globalized world, 
in a world uh, that is multi-ethnic, multicultural, in which we all live side by side, either physically um, or online? How do we deal with cultural sensitivities? And what I see as, alongside very legitimate concerns that people have, an increasingly worrying phenomenon, which is the public's desire to raise almost to a human right, the right to take offense. It is almost as if we are looking for reasons, anytime, any place, anywhere, to take offense. And that is something that I think is, uh, w we may well uh, uh, develop in the course of this discussion. Um, this afternoon. So um, that's enough from me. I will introduce our fellow panelists as uh, they make uh, their introductory uh, remarks. First up, uh, Shoma Chowdhury, who is uh, managing editor of Tehelka. I've had dealings with Tehelka for some time. It is, as you all know better than I do, a fantastic um, investigatory uh, vehicle offline and online, has done some uh, very courageous work over time. And so, Shoma, first of all, maybe if you could give us an overview of where you see free expression challenges are in India. Thanks, John. You know, I, um, I'm actually extremely worried about the, the kind of status of freedom of expression in India. I think that we take it too much for granted. It's in extreme jeopardy. We assume that because it is a constitutional right, uh, you know, enshrined in, in our constitution that it will be there for the having always. But I think that as, it, as we stand today, it's in extreme jeopardy. And although I myself am uh, somebody whose only point of reference in, in the conduct of whatever public life that I lead, or in, in, in many ways the pr uh, private life that I lead, would be the constitution, today I'm of the view that we really need to throw open to debate 19.2 of the Constitution, which restricts our freedom of speech. John mentioned something which is very important, which is that across the board, across strata, across communities, across religion, today we've become a society that is extremely quick to take offense. Every day, we'll see a report in the newspapers that speaks in inverted commas of somebody's sentiment that has been hurt. And today I'd like to put to you that as a society, we must assert the right to be able to hurt people's sentiment. I, speaking for myself, am a freedom absolutist. I think there can be no substitute for the freedom of speech. And I think I need to caveat that with two things. One is that when we talk of freedom of speech, one is about cultural production, cinema, art, music, theater, anything in which we are allowed to exercise choice. And I think in that realm, there should be absolutely no restrictions because if you don't want to engage with it, that freedom lies with you. The much more complicated arena is about public discourse. That if somebody is giving a speech to a large public gathering, or if there's an ad in, in our face, if there's a hoarding while going to work that I absolutely cannot ignore, and it is intrusive into my presence, then you know we can open it up because I don't have freedom of, uh, I, I can't exercise choice. But insofar as political speeches, insofar as uh, religious speeches, I think we need to narrow down 19.2, which is that you know, we are not allowed our, our freedom of speech if we uh, spoil or if we offend people's morality, decency, public order, law and order. All of these have become smoke screens. I think the only narrow restriction we should have is that we are restricted from inciting violence, inciting discrimination, and inciting hostility. To that, you know, Tim, t Tim is not here, but he's running this freedom of speech debate where one of the principles is that respect the believer, but not the beliefs. I think we must have the right to mock each other's beliefs, to question each other's beliefs, but respect the believer. I would stand by the right of everybody to practice their religions, to not be restricted from opportunity to work, from any of the rights that are enshrined in our constitution, but I should be able to challenge your beliefs and to uh, question them. I just want to, before I stop, quickly run through some of the, you, you know, that there is almost no distinction today between the Hindu right, the Muslim right, the Catholic right, Dalits, everybody. But I just want to hold up a quick mirror to ourselves. Recently, there was a campaign in the uh, uh, fallout of the Delhi gang rape when a young group of students ran this petition to ban Hani Singh. And I think that's a mirror to how narrow we are becoming, that even the liberals, when they feel offended by something, want to start banning it. 
and I was speaking at JNU, which is the, you know, the bastion of left liberal values. And they were completely supportive of the ban. They said, Hani Singh is so offensive. You know, he, 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 he urges people to be violent to women. And I said, why do you ask the state to ban it? Because today you're offended. Somebody else will be offended another day. You know, protect his right to do whatever music he wants. If you want to start a campaign, make it a voluntary boycott of him. You know, kill him off by removing the, commercial, uh, the plug of commercial success. But defend his right to do whatever music he will. And so, just to end, I'd say that I think we are at a precipice. We take too much for granted. We have an extremely illuminate, uh, luminous document, but that does not mean it's not up for question. The state caves in every day on the issue of law and order. They make it pre facto. I think it should be post facto. If somebody gives offense and it leads to a law and order situation, the state should be stopping that law and order situation rather than stopping the provocation. We have to become a more liberal society and defend that liberalness. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Shema, for that very powerful um, initial overview of the Indian situation. There's much more um, we'll be looking at um, in the course of the debate. Um, to my right, Orlando Fijis is, is known to uh, many of you, all of you perhaps, as a fantastic uh, chronicler, writer, author of um, the, the darkest period um, of Soviet uh, life. Um, his books are moving, powerful, and um, are uh, both a, a pleasure to read, but also cast um, for those who uh, did not see, particularly for the younger generation, who did not see um, the way um, the uh, authoritarian uh, paradigm uh, worked. Um, it is very telling and very pertinent to the modern day. And Orlando, I was wondering if you can start by really uh, bringing forward those lessons um, of that Soviet era into now, into the modern Russia, and also what I call um, soft authori the, the soft authoritarian model that is increasing in salience around the world. Yes, thank you, John. I mean, maybe it would be a good time to frame this whole debate around the founding principles and reasons for freedom of speech, which are, firstly, there should be a marketplace of ideas, and secondly, that freedom of speech must be the underpinning of democracy, and everything you've said, I think, relates very powerfully to the marketplace, that we should talk out our differences um, and different views without claiming a right to take offence and prosecute and silence people. I'm more concerned, obviously, with a society, a post-totalitarian and, I would say now, authoritarian state, in which the underpinning of democracy in free speech is very questionable. And I'm much more concerned about the direct threat to democracy in post-authoritarian societies. And some of the legacies that John was, was intimating at I think I um, need to be put into this discussion too in post-authoritarian states where before, in a sense, before you can have free speech or before you can have a, an audience for free speech and free exchange of ideas to develop democracy, you must have people able to make independent thoughts, to think independently. And one of the legacies of 75 years of totalitarianism is that people don't have that. One of the most interesting surveys about Russian popular attitudes to the situation in Russia about media ownership today, because like in many parts of the world, I dare say India too, there's a real problem in Russia over state domination of television or domination of television by companies which are quasi-governmental organizations or owned by politicians in league with the major players in the state. And the same would go more or less for newspapers. But there was a poll done in 2010, I think, in which they found that most Russians were quite happy with that. They didn't deny it. They were quite aware of the fact that there was an imbalance in the presentation of the, the main candidates in presidential elections. But they thought that was OK, because the nature of television for them must be to represent order and security. So, in a sense, that's already a problem before we enter the free exchange of ideas. And then, putting it into a more historical perspective, I'd like to broaden the framework of this discussion, because, you know, free speech, of course, is essential for democracy. And governments, authoritarian governments, don't like 
an active internet with free exchange of ideas. And, and we'll try and block it, filter it, close down sites and all the rest of it. But um, Yevgeny Morozov, who studied the way authoritarian regimes have, have used or tried to turn around the internet, developed this wonderful phrase, slacktivism. In other words, people who get worked up about freedom of speech issues while sitting in their armchairs and doing nothing. And that's very easy to fall into that trap because actually freedom of speech only becomes a real issue when it translates into protest, when it translates into activism. If we think going back historically to the great 19th century movements of independence, of the Chartist movement in Britain or of revolutionary and socialist movements, it's the freedom of speech always came with freedom of assembly. And freedom of speech was the freedom to write what you want, print what you wanted, but it was always the first stage to then the freedom to gather and protest. Governments may not like freedom of speech and what people say, but they think they can probably control it or deal with it, put up with it as just a nuisance. But they're much more jumpy when it gets translated, when ideas galvanize people and put them on the streets. And that's when governments, clearly, as we've seen recently, can quickly change. So I think we need to couple freedom of speech issues with freedom of assembly issues. Thank you very much indeed, Orlando. Basharat Pia um, has written um, on one of the most difficult subjects, perhaps, um, Kashmir. And <laughs> I was wondering, Bashar, can you talk about sedition and the state and how all of that has affected you and your writings and draw some broader conclusions? Uh, thank you, John. Well, I mean, on, on the question of uh, sedition and the power of the state and how it works, I mean, one of my, if, if one, when we, I was asked to be on this panel, I was like, okay, what do I think about when I, when I really think about a censor. Like, what kind of an image comes to mind? And since we deal with images, and, uh, and I suddenly find myself smiling because the, the face I saw was this, this is early 2000s, I was a young reporter in Kashmir, and uh, you would end up at various press conferences. And there was this man and this tall, gangly man with a rather luxurious mustache, a, a kind of a mini Virapan mustache, and in this ill-fitted leather jacket and these loose trousers. And I thought he was a very diligent reporter for a, for a news, local newspaper that was struggling. And he would always take notes and uh, also note all the questions that were asked. And you would bump into him on the street some days and he would ask about your parents and ask how you were and what's going on. And then he'll say, you know, I, I was meaning to go to that event uh, they were talking about disappearances there, those women whose children have gone missing. And I meant to go there, but I, I had to drop my son to his school. Can you tell me what happened? And uh, I am not very sure whether I told him much, but I learned very soon that he was the police officer in charge of reporting on the press and uh, sort of kind of uh, the, the, the human face of a very broad uh, architecture of surveillance and censorship. And then there was this other image which has been sort of uh, coming back to me every now and then. It's a sound, it's like this crackle on your telephone. It's like a landline in the old days when the landlines were bad and we tried to do a trunk call. There was a static. And that was always there when, you, when the cell phones came. And then you learned it, it, was, it happened when your phones were tapped. And we had jokes about it in Kashmir. Of course, in such situations, black humor develops. But in, in that context, you know, the, the story of uh, surveillance and censorship go together and, and they go a long way back and the question of sedition. I mean, in, in, it's a well-known story, in, especially in the Indian context. You know, in, in 1953 when Sheikh Abdullah was uh, jailed by his dear friend Nehru, uh, the one of the few people who came out, of his, uh, came out in his defense was uh, a major leader of the Indian Freedom Movement, a woman called Mridullah Sarabhai. And, and then you realize that it's not just the layman, just not some ordinary person without much power. But when the state is out to exercise censorship and curtail dissent, 
in the name of a security state or censorship, then even somebody as eminent and you know, well-known as Mridullah Sarabai could have been put in prison for, for treason. And, and she did have to spend time in jail. And that process you know, has continued. We have seen evocations of various, you know, which are essentially colonial laws that haven't been modified despite 60 years. We still continue to have an official secrets act, which can be deployed in a, in a rather bizarre way. I mean, the well-known case of a journalist in Delhi who actually spoke here last year was Iftikhar Gilani. I mean, he had downloaded a paper from some Pakistani think tank. It wasn't even a very good paper. And then the man in the NDA government, uh, when Mr. Adwani was the deputy prime minister, and, I mean, he had to spend nine months in prison. But essentially, what was that about? That was political pressure. That was a degree of discomfort with a, with a man's reporting and writing. And, and, and more recently, I mean, we saw in the case of the charges of sedition against Arundhati Roy and others. I mean, there's many who would agree with her, who would disagree with her. And the statement when she talked about Kashmir being disputed, I mean, it wasn't even, you know, anything new. But this, it's, it's a growing tendency, this, this sense of threat. But it has also evolved. It's not just violence or, or threat, but it's also in, in our context, especially, uh, I mean, when you're talking about newspapers, we shouldn't only think about, you know, major magazines and newspapers that are published out of Delhi. But there is a, there's hundreds of small newspapers published out of state capitals and smaller cities, whether some, it's a newspaper from Patna or a newspaper from Srinagar. There is this whole mechanism, and I've spoken to scores of journalist friends about it who have been dealing with it, is that it is through the inducement of you know, the whole tradition of the government advertisements. That's, that's, that's become a way to control. So, in, in, in Kashmir at the moment, and, and largely, I've, I've read some serious reports from Bihar and, and Gujarat, it is through cutting the economic lifeline. A small newspaper which might do an important service about really important questions in a, in a particular state, it, it might not have the circulation enough to generate the kind of ads that would make it feasible. Traditionally, they have been like dependent on support from various government heads, so whether it's waterworks or power development, and, and they got by. I mean, nobody makes huge amounts of money. But now that's sort of been implicitly off late, tied to, uh, tied to kind of sanitizing the news, and I know this for certain in, in, in Kashmir, that's been happening. But the larger, the larger case of sedis sedition and using those punitive provisions of law, I mean, these, these, this is still a le legacy of colonialism, which was a state, you know, it was all about controlling the populace. And if 60, 65 years down the road, we still have to deal with such laws, then it's, it's time to think hard about some changes in legislation and, and to rethink about those questions. Thank you very much indeed, Bashar. I think there's one uh, connection we've all, uh, I've already identified here, and that is often the journalists, the bloggers in the localities, in the smaller towns, in the villages, in the small newspapers, on the small websites, are at the greatest risk. Because national, big figures, people with public profiles, it doesn't protect them fully, by no means. There are many examples, uh, not least in, in, in Russia, not least here. Um, but the more local, the more you are trying to find out, the more your information will affect the people with power um, that are more easily identifiable and who will more easily uh, wish to stop you from doing that. Which brings me on to our fourth speaker, John Burnside, um, Scottish poet, novelist, um, memoirist. Um, but on, in this occasion, John, you wanted to talk about um, the extent to which... Uh, among other things you, you're going to talk about, the extent to which um, the private sector um, gets up to all kinds of things to stop people from finding out what is done in their name. Yeah, um, I think I'm here mainly because I represent kind of continuity with when the whole uh, cycle kicked off in Edinburgh. Um, but um, what I want to draw attention to is, and, and, and it may be more urgent where I am than here, um, having heard about the kind of state uh, uh, censorship and state controls is, in a sense, what happens afterwards, after the state, as it were, sees that kind of direct control. Uh, people think it goes away. What happens then, of course, is that um, commercial interests control us, control what we know, 
control what we talk about, control how we uh, share information, um, control the information we actually share. Um, in the context of, of what I've been doing in the last several years, um, in, in mostly environmental related work, um, it's, it's become very apparent that um, there's a whole range of different approaches that private and, um, companies and individuals can actually exercise to control what, what gets known about what they're doing and what gets known about what they're intending to do. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to suggest perhaps that, uh, for example, here I get a very clear idea that um, members of governments, local government, for example, are directly involved in the businesses which are uh, benefiting. Obviously in Britain that might not be the case visibly, but the whole political apparatus of a country like Britain is completely controlled by commercial factors. That business runs the country for its own interest. Um, there's really good um, writing about, for example, why is the whole uh, of Britain's um, sense of its self-worth and its sense of um, its, uh, its um, prosperity decided by what happens within one square mile of the entire country, which is the city of London. I've been involved in campaigns um, in Scotland to try and protect the environment against um, bad uses of, of uh, different kinds of energy, uh, of, of a whole range of energy, some that are classed as renewable and some that are classed as not, not so, and some are seen as green in the more general um, mainstream um, uh, publications, but in fact are not. Um, what becomes very apparent is how much money people are willing to spend and how much energy they're willing to put into what we call greenwashing products. And products which are, have absolutely no environmental benefit, are actually environmentally destructive, are seen as somehow environmentally beneficial. When you begin to investigate that and try to in expose that, the companies behind this will resort to any number of different tactics. They're not the government. The government can wash its hands of what's happening and it's, it's, it's farmed out to private individuals, it's farmed out, farmed out to individual companies. These include things like surveillance, um, specious legal threats. So if you're an activist following a certain line, a company will suddenly slap on you all kinds of strange specious legal threats, which you can't afford to fight. And they may be completely empty, but you'll be forced into court and you'll be forced to spend the money to try and defend yourself against um, what's happening. Not necessarily just libel, other, other things too. Um, but other things, for example, this has happened to me directly, uh, you, you go, you're sitting, in, in my case, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Vancouver, I open my laptop, I get an email from a fellow campaigner, I open the email, it makes no sense to me, it's, it's just a vague, random set of sentences, and I think that's strange, I better call her and find out what's going on. The next time I use my laptop, I can't use it because it's been melted. All my data's gone, my operating system's destroyed. When I take that laptop to a friend who's a hacktivist, who looks at it closely, says, yeah, this is, this is something really sophisticated. You'd have to pay quite a lot of money to be able to do this. This isn't just somebody who disagrees with you. A company is paying someone to do this. This has happened to four or five people I know. In one case, um, one particularly courageous individual, who, who, who it became very clear that nothing could be done to, to, to stop her from pursuing the line she was pursuing. Um, a member of her family had pornography planted on their computer. And then the police suddenly arrived, acting on a tip, and, and went into the guy's house, took all his computer stuff away, all of his papers and stuff away, and arrested him on suspicion of dealing in pornography. He had no history of, of, of using pornography or dealing in it. So these are the kind of nefarious activities that are used, being used by private companies, by commercial companies. And the question this raises for me is, um, we get exercised about state control and state censorship and state oppression. Yeah, we should be. But when, that, when that we move away from that, what happens next is subtler and perhaps less visible but it's just as destructive of the exchange of information. And it seems to me that discussions of censorship and freedom of speech within the current framework of most societies is something that is a little bit of a luxury in a way for people like me, certainly in Britain, 
because um, we need radical social change to be even able to talk about real freedom for people to really decide for themselves what kind of energy they use, what kind of products they use, what the dangers of those products are to themselves and to their environment. Thank you very much indeed, John, for a couple, with a couple of uh, very salutary examples. Um, Shoma, I just wanted to come back to the Indian context, and particularly online. Um, there was the 2000 Act, there was the 2008 um, Amendment, and then in 2011, uh, in the Intermediary Guidelines, which uh, I was just having um, a look at, in which service providers have to take down uh, any content within 36 hours, and they don't have to uh, inform the people who posted uh, the content um, about it, and they're not able to contest the decision. And this, um, the uh, potentially uh, harmful, uh, offensive content includes information that is disparaging, harmful, blasphemous, pornographic, encourages gambling, infringes pro uh, proprietary rights, or threatens the unity, integrity, defense, security, or sovereignty of India, friendly relations with foreign states, or public order. Now, there probably isn't very much non-fiction writing or journalism that you couldn't, in some way, fall into any of these categories on one day or another. How on earth does the online community, particularly the, the community that tries to find things out, how on earth do you grapple with this legislation? Thanks, John. You know, I, I already said that I think for me, it's really become important for us to define much more precisely under what conditions can our freedom of speech be restricted. The, you know, amendment rules that John just read out are completely pernicious and a great example of how things can go wrong if statutorily and, and legislatively things are badly framed. Uh, you know, even in Tehelka, we wrote about this back in 2008 and in 2011 when it came out, saying that this is just not even a slippery slope, it's already a jump off the precipice, you know, because if you're going to have a law which says that if you say something that is disparaging or uncomfortable or X, Y, Z, everything else that he read out, it pretty much restricts your, you know, we might as well all be silent. And so the point that I'd really like to make is that, of course, the state is erring on the side of, uh, of disaster, you know, but what about us? We are always willing to be offended. So if we are going to stand up for this, if we are going to stand up for our freedom to speak, we have to be willing to be made uncomfortable. Freedom can only be exercised in the face of provocation, in the face of discomfort. And you have to stand up for that when you're feeling uncomfortable about something that somebody has said. Uh, just to come back to what John said about the state taking stuff off offline, uh, uh, online. You know, India is a very, very complex country and we are so plural and so diverse. One can understand governments having a kind of, you know, difficulty in how to balance that. Again, I'll bring us back to the idea of precision. Online, I think you have to be factual if you're going to want to have your right to say things. You can have an opinion, that's fine, but if you are going to f uh, float falsehood, which by the way floats around all the time now, I think it is within the realm of legitimate uh, censorship. You know, if you're going to float factually incorrect things, it falls under a very simple uh, paradigm of defamation. A good example recently is about the big exodus that happened uh, you know, from everywhere in the country back to the Northeast when Northeastern students had to flee because there was factually incorrect information floating around on the net. Now, in my book, that doesn't fall under the freedom of expression, you know, because what you're really doing is trading in falsehoods. But, like I said earlier, just to repeat myself, I would stand by the right to offend any, give, any given day. You know, you have to stand by the right of that. By the same breath, I would stand by those people whose, whose beliefs and value systems offend me. I would stand by their right to access every freedom and every right that the Constitution grants them in my country or anywhere in the world. So that basic human right of access to justice, opportunity, freedom, X, Y, Z, must stand uncontrovertible, but then we, can, we should have the freedom to provoke and to speak if you're not inciting violence. And you know, I think we have to urge our governments to stand by that. Thank you. Um, before we take questions, which we're going to do uh, very, very shortly, and so please uh, get ready for asking questions, uh, and the microphones are going to be um, coming to you. Um, Orlando, you just very quickly wanted to come yes, in on that. I just really wanted to echo what Shona just said, because...
Russia, they have similar, uh, since last November, laws, uh, filtration laws, and similar blanket powers, uh, and have used them against certain um, online newspapers in the past um, without those laws. But, you know, when they do use them, they nearly always... Uh, justify their actions by saying that what was online that they're taking off is inciting, is, is hate speech or is offending somebody. So I just want to, you know, th that, and that is for them a way of subverting the whole freedom of speech platform. So we do have to be, I think, really much more robust in allowing you know, people to be offended, quite frankly, um, in order to defend the really important aspect of freedom of speech, which is the pluralism and the defense of democracy. In, in an arts context, I had to chair a session a couple of years ago um, in the UK uh, for, for the uh, UK Arts Council, and it was on free expression in the arts. And um, one uh, theatre um, manager said to me, without sort of seeing in any of this a problem, he said that he convened um, a focus group um, on a standing basis uh, regularly uh, in his uh, English town. And they would put to them what they were planning to show in the theatre for the forthcoming period and would ask uh, the focus group if anything that was being proposed remotely caused any offence to any of the assembled, uh, in which case uh, they decided not to show it. And you can see where that leads in terms of artistic creativity and artistic um, self-expression, which isn't just uh, the hard in information investigative side. So that's enough from, uh, from us, from the panel. Uh, questions, where are, where are the mics? Have we got, uh, could you, uh, we've got so many. We've got one mic there and one mic here, is, is that right? Okay, if you can identify a couple of people uh, towards the back, um, and we're gonna take two or three questions together, um, and please make your questions or your observations incredibly brief. If you're gonna make a speech, I'm going to, to Ex uh, I'm going to um, show great free expression and I'm going to cut you off. Right. Uh, so, um, since we're discussing about freedom of speech and expression, uh, I just wanted to know uh, what the panel thought about the anti-sedition uh, laws that exist in India right now because I think it's a colonial uh, remnant that should be done away with. It's like it would help a colo colonial imperial government and not a democratic one that we have right now. So I just wanted them more to speak about the Thank sedition you. laws. Thank you. That was the first question. Anti-sedition. The second question was... Uh, have you given the microphone there? Yeah. Could you stand up, please, so we can see you? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you have already identified the uh, problem with the state and the uh, business uh, corporations which limit freedom of expression. I would suggest the third one, uh, which is the unequal access to information, uh, freed freedom from what Amrita is saying in his book, Development as Freedom Calls, freedom from illiteracy, ill health, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so unless you have an enabling uh, situation where the poor tribe can ha have the same playing field, there is no very freedom of equal expression to all. Thank you. A very good, very good point. Uh, uh, here, and then we'll go to answers quickly. Uh, sir, I think nobody disputes that uh, freedom of expression is not available in any society to an extent that it should be, and it is necessary, done. But what is freedom of expression? Here is one panelist, Shoma, who said that she is an absolutist. But in spite of that, she puts a caveat and she, she says that anything that incites violence or discrimination. Now, it takes you back to square one. Mm. Because what incites violence? What is discrimination? Who will decide that? Anything, any book, they say it incites violence. This is discriminatory. So, okay. either... <laughs> We have Fine. to find a clean definition. Thank you. Th three really, really good questions. We need really, really um, quick, um, quick answers. On the sedition, did we sort of address that before? Is there anything more, Bashar, you wanted to s say on that? You need the mic. Just but very quickly, because uh, there's so I mean, many questions we want to get through. We've only got 20 minutes. I mean, the, see, the sedition, they, there has to be... This, it's, it's not just sedition, but there's a lot of laws that, that really need to be thought about hard. And, and, and evaluated whether they, whether they fit the claims of a society at a particular time. I mean, if there's a certain aspiration in India today and there's a, there's a certain idea of a self-image, then it's important to look, about, look at, you know, if, if we claim to be an open democratic society, could really we live with laws like this? And, and we saw, 
you know, there's some moment where when, when it, it, it's sad that, you know, unless it just seems that there, without extreme public pressure, there is very little movement on these things. I mean, the laws on sexual assault in India, to, just to make a different point, were extremely arcane and needed work. And except for the horrific incident in Delhi recently, I mean, only now we have a Justice Verma Commission report talking about, you know, changing those laws. So there is, there is the need to look at so many other laws. So yes, the sedition laws are problematic. The Official Secrets Act needs to be look, looked at. I mean, these are really, the, there's a whole rubric of laws. There's a, there's a law called Armed Forces Special Powers Act. There's a public safety. All of those things have to be looked hard at. I mean, they sh they're not laws worthy of a society that wants to be a civilized society. Um, Shoma, the gentleman's point there, as soon as you qualify freedom of expression, as soon as you start saying it, but not in the cases of incitement to violence, in, in your point, which I think is more contentious, the spreading of false rumors, then nobody is a free expression advocate. Can you answer that point? Yeah, uh, Javid Saab, you know, just to go back to what I said, I said insofar as cultural production goes, which is to do with cinema, art, music, theater, anywhere in the realm where you can exercise choice, whether you want to see it or uh, engage with it, I'm a freedom absolutist. Insofar as large public spaces, why I was saying that I would caveat that with incitement to violence, because that is much more clearly definable than something that hurts my sentiment. Sentiment is the most amorphous kind of word that can possibly exist. And so I certainly want to throw out the idea of hurt sentiments from, from our vocabulary. But insofar as incitement to violence, it would be very clearly, you know, one could clearly define it as urging people to pick up arms and kill Brahmins to kill Dalits, you know, or Dalits to kill uh, Yadavs. You know, it's much more clearly definable. Discrimination, again, because I'm saying as much as freedom of speech is our constitutional right, our access to equal opportunity and to travel anywhere, work anywhere within the country is also an enshrined uh, constitutional right. So when Bal Thackeray or Raj Thackeray says that Biharis cannot come to uh, Bombay, he is certainly crossing the boundaries of freedom of speech because he is trying to cut off the access of people from other fundamental rights. And so I would caveat that uh, and still remain a freedom absolutist. Um, there's much more to be said on, on that front. Uh, John, the, the, the question about unequal access to information, literacy, the sense of free expression is fine as long as you can get the information just very, very briefly because we've got dozens of questions. Just a few words on that. Actually, this came, this came up in the discussions in Cape Town, um, talking about the way in which library boards control what kinds of books are available in libraries. Um, and Britain will begin to think of libraries as a luxury anyway. Um, but the li library boards very much control what goes into certain libraries and what kinds of books are available to people. Um, and of course, there's a social class dimension to this, because there's a social class dimension to everything. If you um, are working class or if you're poor um, and, and you can't get access to the internet, which happens to a lot of people, you can't even do things like a, apply for jobs in Britain now, and you can't even claim social security benefit without access to a computer, which assumes that you have a computer in the first place. People who can't afford computers tend to be people who are unemployed. There's a vicious circle going on, which is a, you know, the social class oppression of people um, via now the new media. Right, we've got lots of questions. Could I, where are the microphone uh, handlers? Right, um, but I also want to say, please uh, pay attention to people at the back as well. And we're going to take half a dozen questions now. Right, gentleman here. Yeah, you know, I think uh, my, prob my problem wait, wait, is we'll come to you. that uh, most of you are confusing absolute freedom. And, and I, I also believe, I'm a complete abs uh, believer that any impingement on in my independence creative or self-expression or, or merely uh, expression of thought uh, is repugnant to my independence. However, please do not have this politico-centric view that the public discourse ir is restricted only to the politics of the nation. The creative and the social comment which happens, which includes films, television, theater, music, etc., are also uh, perhaps have a larger role to play in, in, uh, uh, in, in sort of maintaining the independence which we are all talking about. So you cannot have two degrees of independence. 
Right. It's either a complete independence of thought or, right. or, or no, no independence. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at the back. Yes. Uh, yeah, right there. I have two brief comments. I come from Nepal, and I think what I have to say refers to situations from Balochistan to Nagaland, Kashmir to Sri Lanka, and Tibet is an entirely different uh, consideration, of course. First, the point that uh, it is indeed true that those who, are, who have national limelight and those who have limelight internationally have a duty to say and do much more in terms of freedom of expression. But what we find is that the capital establishment and the national elites are the ones who are the most silent, who succumb to populism more than anybody else. Right. And my second point is simply that among the four panelists, there was no reference to the term self-censorship, even though I believe it was referred to indirectly, especially yeah. by Bashar al yeah. yeah. it is a there is a much larger volume of denial of information because of self-censorship. What that means is that it is not only pointing at the authorities and the authoritarians and the demagogues, but it is the ability to succumb by individual journalists, writers, reporters, television people and publishers. So I would wish that there is a highlighting of the issue of self-censorship. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very important point. Uh, here and then afterwards, could we have some people in the middle as well, please? The middle rows haven't been uh, paid attention to. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, so I feel that uh, shouldn't there be a distinction that ought to be made between uh, techniques that the state has acquired uh, in order to curtail freedom of, uh, freedom of speech and expression to continue with its hegemony and to maintain the socio-economic status quo because there is also a process, cultural process, a historical process of uh, cultural misrecognition that has been going on, which has seen basically in the realm of cultural production, only certain sections of the society that also happen to be the minorities, be socio, uh, cultural or economic, that have been the targets, you know, of misrepresentation. So as a woman or let's say as a Muslim, I'll have problems to it. And secondly, you were talking about, uh, you know, the right to offend people. Don't you think that the problem is that as a society, we've become extremely tolerant of offending certain sections of people who again happen to be the economic or the social or the cultural, you know, uh, non-dominant uh, groups. So again, we see the Muslims, the Dalits, the women. And I don't think that when you're talking about historical process of cultural misrecognition, you can just reduce it to the question of choice because it's much broader than that. And generally, when you're talking about freedom of speech and expression, you can't just see it in black or white terms. That's Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. There's an interesting strain uh, going on, which is a sort of sense of double standards of certain minorities, certain groups feeling alienated or being, being offended and others uh, or being disparaged and others not being. And also this sense of a sort of elite domination. Let's take a, f a few more. Uh, right. Where's, where's the mic? Um, I, so I, I, uh, I want to say that it's a very, very fine discussion on the freedom of speech and also freedom of expression. And Tahleka has given the, that 19.2 uh, should also be. I want to give, give the opinion, I mean, uh, two images. One, uh, um, by MF Hussain, another Rushdi. You see, we, are we not suffering from double standard uh, in terms of our responses? And if you take uh, Arundhati's opinion, what is wrong? Thousands of people, m Muslims were, I mean, raped, but our conscience, collective conscience was silent. Right, so could you just say, I mean, with reference to MF Hussain and Salman Rushdie, what exactly is your question? Uh, what I mean, the, with reference, uh, the uh, MF Hussain had to take shelter outside because of the vandalism, yeah. and then we uh, uh, appreciate too much for Rushdie, and who Tarun has said, uh, any person right. from said so that he what is your question? My question is, we have to understand, objectively, we have to take account of all those matters and we should not be subjective to some kind of violence. Right. So okay. let us be very true in, in <coughs> understanding our freedom of speech and expression, not to playing to the lobby. Um, okay. I have um, a very brief question over here. Where? Uh, I can't see you. In the middle, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, just about, uh, no, no one spoke about anonymity on the internet, yeah. and that seems to yeah. be one of the most um, uh, regressive and uh, sneaky ways of being offensive and uh, hurting other people's sentiments on the internet. So is there anything being done to curtail people's ability to be anonymous? Okay, that, oh, a really good set of questions. Willie, can we have another two hours, please? Um. <laughs> 
good. We're not going to get everything. We're really not going to get um, a, a, a sore through. Just uh, if I could just take on the uh, the gentleman's point um, about self censorship. Very very well made. It was sort of, I suppose, so understood. The the, the great difficulty, particularly in the NGO sector, looking at freedom of expression, is that it's impossible to quantify self censorship because it's what's not said, what people are not doing all the time, um, that's incredibly difficult. Your average non-fiction book author in the UK, even though we're reforming the libel laws, and Index was at the heart of that, um, I, my last book, Plug, Freedom for Sale, I had a 50-page libel report, and that's quite normal. Um, uh, so you literally say, you say, no, I want to stand up for that. No, I want to stand up for that. And then you say, oh, sod it. Yeah, okay, I won't bother saying that. I won't say that. I won't say that. I'll tone this down. It happens all the time uh, to authors, and it's incredibly difficult to quantify. It's what a Singaporean friend called to me the out-of-bound markers, and nobody actually quite knows where they are, so you always keep well in field, and that is, that is um, a, a grave danger. Basharat, you wanted to talk very quickly about the issue of anonymity because it cuts... It cuts both ways. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, there's no dispute about, you know, the rise of the anonymous, uh, you know, censor. And I mean, I, I sort of, in this context, it's sort of my, my first encounter with that was in, in 2000, 2001. I used to work for a website. I mean, this is pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter days. And we used to get, you know, comments like hundreds of comments on news stories. And, and that, that's a pro I mean, that was the, and it was scary when you're, you know, just starting out as a reporter and suddenly something you write, and there is really like 200 emails lining up in your account, and you don't know whether these people are real or not. But, and that has been various political groups, so various political groups have used this technique of the anonymous, you know, phone call, email, and, and going after a set of authors or a particular author, they had, it's, it's very organized now, and it, it has been perfected into an art form. I mean, if, if you look at any, any number of pieces on sensitive questions in, in India or in the region, the moment a piece appears, then like within 15 minutes, there's, there's 50 comments, you know, full of absolute bile, not judging the literary merit or the factual grounds. I mean, there, there are things that can be all about yeah. your father's jacket. So okay. that is a serious problem, and one doesn't Th know the answer. Thanks, Prashant. It cuts the other way as well, also, in terms of uh, if you give your name, uh, states and other authorities can, can hold it against you, and there's a huge amount of data collection uh, as well. Uh, Shomi, you wanted to go uh, back on the, 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 the issue of minorities and the sort of uh, perception of double standards. Yeah, you raised this question that, you know, most uh, offenses against minorities or those who are more helpless in our society and wh while I'd agree with you that that's the kind of norm, it's not the exclusive norm, you know, there's as much offense coming at what one would say the Hindu majority in this country, but I do accept that usually discrimination uh, uh, offenses against minorities, Dalits, Muslims, women. I would still say to you that we have to be able to live with that, you know, because, but if their access to, as I've already said, any opportunity or any rights is cut off, then you can stand up and you know, uh, fight against that. But as long as it's offense, you have to believe that these communities will empower and enable themselves to fight back that discourse. You know? But if you're going to be completely protective and paternalistic about it, we will remain completely static as a society. So much of the boundaries of society are pushed because there is debate and there's annoyance. I'd like to say to the Muslims last year who were upset with Salman Rushdie that most of us haven't read the satanic verses. How do they know I may be offended on their behalf if I knew what it was about? But we are constantly talking in a complete vacuum of ignorance, you know? And so you have to be, I, let me bring to you another very contentious one, which was the uh, Ambedkar cartoon that was introduced into the books. Now, you know, again, the Helka's work has stood up for Dalits all the 12 years we've been around. But I stood for the right of that cartoon to be in the textbook. I think the debate would have been much more productive if we had argued for two versions, two interpretations of that cartoon. One interpretation of it is that Nehru was whipping a slow process of constitution making. Another saw it as a Brahmin whipping a Dalit. Now both those interpretations should have been in the textbook and let's open it up for dialogue. We can't keep shutting ourselves off from all sense of discomfort. Right, sorry for curbing everybody's free speech, but um, we're going to take a couple more quick questions and we've got to, we're going to be kicked off the stage at half past one because there's a, a book signing that comes immediately afterwards. Two or three more questions or observations. Then I'm going to put a vote to the audience.
Uh, they, uh, there was a question which was uh, raised by uh, Shabana Azmi in, in a session yesterday that uh, although, it, and it uh, refers to the, to the argument of uh, cultural um, expression that Shoma talked about and absolutism in that sense. Uh, now, a lot of women, women actors are, are seen to be making certain choices which Shabana said that, that they were no, they, uh, uh, which was actually not the case. They were not really exercising that kind of freedom. Maybe it is a, it is a part of that, it, it, is a, uh, it is an outcome of the indoctrination. Please, uh, like, uh, can you throw a little more okay. light on the role Thank of you. media which should shoulder responsibility? Thank you, and then right here, because you get a first prize for persistence. Um, <laughs> This is uh, with regard to what um, Shoma Ma'am said about being a freedom absolutist. It's open to the panel. Um, have you ever personally found something that you found as offensive, but when you are you are a freedom absolutist, mm. you wouldn't? It's it, you know it's a conscious choice that no, I'm not going to take offense. Do you have any personal experience with that? Uh, yeah, uh, do you want to answer those two questions? Really, yeah, really quick. Very, very no more quickly. questions, I'm afraid. Sorry. Absolutely. You know, every given day of my life, every minute, Twitter assaults me all the time. You know, not only with abuse and opinion, which is bilious, but with factually incorrect crap. You know, but yeah. I live with it. And I wouldn't want any, uh, uh, any structures of state to come down on them. Mostly, I ignore them, you know. But I think your question about violence was much more interesting. Because I think the problem today is that we are holding this bugbear of, you know, uh, creating violence the opposite way. Inciting violence is very easy. If I, as uh, Oasi just did, he said, remove the police for 15 minutes and we'll, d you know, uh, do away with 100 crore Hindus. Or Bal Thackeray and Raj Thackeray repeatedly, Praveen Togadia repeatedly should have had their freedoms restricted. But I think the problem is today that too many communities, whether it's Dalits, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, you name it, women, men, everyone stands up and says, you've said something which I'm going to, f my sentiment is hurt, so I'm going to be violent about it. And by that threat of violence, because your sentiment is hurt, you threaten to create a law and order situation and inevitably our cowardly governments across the board cave in. So that's what I was saying, that pre facto threat of violence makes absolutely no sense, you know, and, and that's the difference between inciting violence actually and just imagining violence. Right, you've got 20 seconds to ask a question. Uh, given the paradoxical, uh uh, topic of freedom of speech and expression. Should the access to internet be made a fundamental right as it is in right, uh, right, Finland, okay, Spain, fine. or Estonia? Access to the internet, a fundamental right. Is it a fundamental right? Impossible to enforce. Impossible to enforce, but it's pro it is probably right. Right, now, uh, very quickly, we're going to take a vote. If you don't feel you're qualified to answer, don't answer it. I'm going to ask uh, three simple questions and a show of hands. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say wh what they are very quickly. Do you think there is too much freedom of expression in India, there is not enough freedom of expression in India, or uh, we've got it just about right? Okay, is there, hands up, who thinks there is too much freedom of expression in India and things need to be curtailed a bit? Right, there's probably late dozens, I would say 50, 60, something like that. Okay, who thinks there's not enough freedom of expression in India? Quite a lot of people. Um, and who thinks um, we've got it about right? A sort of probably the same, probably a bit more than, than the answers to the first. So thank you uh, for those answers. Um, th um, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you to John Burnside. Thank you to Shoma Chowdhury. Thank you for Prasharat Pier. And thank you to Orlando Fijis. Lots more on free expression another time.